Mount Vernon, December 14, 1799. The most famous man of his time is no more. George Washington is dead. His wife Martha was so distraught that she left his chamber forever and never set foot in it again. In fact, she could not even bring herself to attend her husband's funeral. Ironically, one of the principal mourners was an English nobleman who had been opposed to the American Revolution, Washington's lifelong friend, Brian, 8th Lord Fairfax. Washington's friendship with the Fairfax family began 50 years earlier. Brian's kinsman was Thomas, 6th Lord Fairfax, Baron of Cameron whose ancestral home was at Leeds Castle in England. Lord Fairfax was the proprietor of a vast domain in Virginia that had been originally granted to his family by King Charles II in 1649. The Northern Neck, as it was called, was composed of over five million acres of land that lay between the Rappahannock and Potomac Rivers, stretching into what is now West Virginia. All in all, it was about a fifth of the entire colony of Virginia. In 1733, Lord Fairfax arranged for his cousin, William Fairfax, to serve as his land agent in Virginia. Land in the proprietary was granted to tenants, indentured servants who had gained their freedom, and other land agents. Along with land ownership went the right to vote. Every landowner had to agree to seat and plant the land within three years and pay Lord Fairfax a quit rent of two shillings per 100 acres of land, payable in tobacco. Black slaves were the main source of labor and accounted for about 30% of the population. A few wealthy families owned most of the land, families such as the Masons of Gunston Hall, along with the Washingtons, Lees, Alexanders, Fitzhughes, and of course, the Fairfaxes. In 1741, William built an estate on a commanding bluff overlooking the Potomac. He called it Belvoir, which in French meant beautiful to see. William's daughter Anne was married to Lawrence Washington, the owner of nearby Mount Vernon. It was through this close family connection that Lawrence's younger brother, George, became a frequent guest at Belvoir, where he befriended William's sons, George William, and his younger brother, Brian. Belvoir soon became a social center for the elite of the area and was noted for its elegant hospitality. Here, George Washington learned the manners of an English gentleman. He was schooled in the social graces and the art of polite conversation. In 1747, Lord Fairfax immigrated to Virginia and resided for a short time at Belvoir. Fresh from London, his lordship was full of news about the mother country. This was a real education for a boy who had not been schooled in England, as was the custom for many of the colonial gentry at the time. The Fairfaxes were impressed with young George. He was tall, strong, and adventurous. In 1748, Lord Fairfax gave Washington one of his first jobs. Along with his friend George William, Washington worked as an assistant to a team of surveyors who were mapping the boundaries of Lord Fairfax's proprietary in the Shenandoah Valley. In 1752, tragedy struck Washington. His beloved brother, Lawrence, died of tuberculosis. 
Eventually, he inherited Mount Vernon. Over the next 45 years, George Washington would enlarge his brother's modest house into a two and a half story mansion and increase his land holdings from 2,000 acres to more than 8,000. Washington's close relationship with the Fairfax family opened many doors for him. With their help, Washington followed in Lawrence's footsteps and secured an appointment as an officer in the Virginia militia. In return, Washington later found a position in the militia for the 17-year-old Brian. The boy was ill-suited for the military. While standing sentinel one night on the frontier, he had a strong religious experience, a prelude to his calling as a clergyman later in life. By 1754, the French and their Indian allies were threatening English claims to the Ohio Valley. In response, Virginia Governor Dinwiddie dispatched Washington and some colonial militia to fortify the forks of the Ohio River at what is now Pittsburgh. When he arrived at the scene, Washington discovered the French were already fortifying the forks. He pulled back and established a small outpost he called Fort Necessity. The French soon attacked and Washington was forced to surrender. George Washington returned in defeat, but he'd proven his ability to command in battle and his courage in fighting for Virginia. The next year, he accompanied the British regiments under General Braddock in another effort to take the forks of the Ohio. Braddock failed, but again, George Washington proved his courage and his ability in battle. He had two horses shot from under him and four bullets through his coat, yet survived without a scratch. Washington was extolled both in the press and in the pulpit for his efforts, as it turned out somewhat prophetically. I may point out to the public the young Colonel Washington, who I cannot but hope Providence has hitherto preserved in so signal a manner for some important service to his country. George Washington was well on his way to becoming an important man in his own right. His friends decided to nominate him for election to the House of Burgesses. A Virginia colonial election was very different than the kind of election we have now. They were always held at the county courthouse, and the sheriff and the justices of the county court, and usually an individual clerk for each of the candidates running, would be sitting at a table. And all the freeholders would gather, and someone, usually the most important person in the county, would walk up, say their name, and then right out loud would say, I've cast my vote for so-and-so. And then somebody else would stand up and say, I am so-and-so, and I cast my vote for so-and-so. So everybody knew how everybody voted, and the important people in the county generally set the tone because it was very hard for a smaller freeholder to vote differently than the important people that they lived around. Washington was defeated in his first attempt at election to office in 1755. After the loss, friends offered him a little friendly advice. Next time, try to be a little more personable. In 1758, he stood for election as a delegate from Frederick County where he was stationed with his military command. Here he had the support, not only of his own men, but of Lord Fairfax himself. Remembering the advice of his friends, Washington took steps to become a better politician. Following the custom of the time, he treated the voters to free drinks. Washington won the election and took his seat in the House of Burgesses along with his neighbor, George Mason of Gunston Hall. Mason was a learned man, respected for his knowledge of the law and classics, and would become Washington's valued friend and colleague in the years to come. With Virginia's frontiers secure, Washington resigned his commission in late 1758, returning home a respected war hero. In 1759, he married Martha Custis, the gracious young widow of one of the richest men in Virginia. Martha brought balance and domesticity into his life and proved to be a wonderful partner. Washington loved her two children, Jackie and Patsy, to whom he was a devoted father throughout their lives. Martha brought as her dower thousands of acres of fertile land, a significant amount of cash, and over 100 slaves. The Washingtons were now elevated into the highest ranks of the Virginia planter aristocracy, 
joining the Fairfaxes and Masons in wealth and social standing. Washington began to take an active part in the public affairs of the county. In 1762, he was elected to the church vestry. Two years later, he was appointed by the governor as a justice to the county courts. With his position in society secure, Washington managed to find some time for the amusements of a Virginia gentleman. His diaries are filled with insights into his leisure time. Visits to Gunston Hall to socialize with his friend, George Mason. Fox hunting with the Fairfaxes. Playing cards. And dancing at Gatsby City Hotel. By his mid-30s, Washington was living a life akin to that of an English country squire. Gradually, some of the colonists began to believe that King George and his parliament were destroying their rights as Englishmen. The British government believed that it had the right to raise money to cover the enormous cost of administering the colonies. Colonials were angered by this taxation since they had no representation in parliament. Washington complained. Parliament hath no more right to put their hands into my pocket without my consent than I have to put my hands into yours for money. As the anti-British sentiments increased in the colony, the Fairfaxes remained aloof from the fray. Lord Fairfax, who is the only English peer living in the colonies, had taken up residence at Greenway Court, his hunting lodge in the Shenandoah Valley in 1761. He was accorded all the privileges of a Virginia citizen and was never threatened. George William Fairfax, who had inherited Belvoir after the death of his father, returned to England in 1773 and never came back to Virginia. Brian Fairfax married and moved to Tolston Grange near Great Falls in 1768. He was now Washington's closest link to the powerful family that had sponsored his early career. On December 16, 1773, the situation with England got worse. The citizens of Boston dumped British tea into the harbor. Parliament responded by closing the port until the damage was paid for. There was outrage throughout the colonies. On July 17, 1774, George Mason rode to Mount Vernon to discuss the deteriorating situation in Washington. Together, they deliberated on Fairfax County's response to Britain's governance of the colonies. The following day, they would meet with other freeholders in Alexandria and approve a document known as the Fairfax Resolves, which stated that if redress were not forthcoming, there could be only one appeal, war. When Brian Fairfax read the Resolves, he was very concerned. He was opposed to such threats against the king. He immediately wrote Washington. I should think myself bound to oppose violent measures now. I therefore think it would be more proper to try what effect a petition might have toward obtaining a repeal of the duty. I would willingly give the parliament a fair opportunity to do it, and therefore should be for a petition unaccompanied with any threats or claims. Politely, Washington disagreed. I cannot conclude without expressing some concern that I should differ so widely in sentiment from you in a matter of such great moment and general import and should much distrust my own judgment upon the occasion if my nature did not recoil at the thought of submitting to measures which I think subversive of everything that I ought to hold dear and valuable. By late 1774, the situation in Fairfax was becoming more tense. Nicholas Cresswell, an Englishman traveling in Virginia, complained that everything was in utmost confusion. Foreign letters were seized, effigies of the Prime Minister were burned, and British sympathizers punished. I am suspected of being what they call a Tory, that is, a friend to my country, and am threatened with tar and feathers, imprisonment, the devil knows what, curse the scoundrels. The colonies were preparing for rebellion. In Fairfax County, a militia company the Fairfax Independent Company of Volunteers was formed. By January of 1775, Washington was drilling the Fairfax Company on the streets of Alexandria. 
It soon became apparent that the militia was in need of powder. Since it would take time for contributions to be collected, Washington and Mason loaned their own money to the militia so that powder could be purchased. On April 19, 1775, Washington was at Mount Vernon, preparing to set out for Philadelphia as a delegate to the Second Continental Congress, when he received news of the battles at Lexington and Concord. Brian Fairfax and Major Horatio Gates were his guests at the time. Fairfax deplored the upcoming conflict. He foresaw that it would array his dearest friends against the British government, to which he was loyally attached and resolved to adhere. The revolution had begun. Washington left for New England to assume command of the Continental Army, leaving Martha and Mount Vernon under the protection of his cousin, Lund Washington. Most of the Fairfax militia went north with their muskets, leaving the remainder to protect the area with clubs as their only weapons. In Boston, Washington took charge of more than 10,000 militiamen and farmers. Over the next two years, he trained and drilled his men and set such a strong example of leadership that the army rallied around him. Washington's determination and vision would eventually turn his men into the best fighters in the world. In early February 1776, George Mason was empowered by the Committee of Safety to assemble a small fleet to protect Alexandria and the estates along the river from an attack by British ships. Mason was called to further service by the Virginia Convention in Williamsburg. He was appointed to a committee to create a Declaration of Rights. George Mason, in drafting it, pointed out specific and collective rights that governments were bound to respect. George Mason marshals strong evidence, powerful arguments in support of natural law, guaranteeing the rights of individuals that were important to the existence of people in the 1770s and 80s as they are today. Mason then set to work on a written constitution for Virginia. A written constitution to restrain and control the government that operated under it was a new development to Englishmen, even American Englishmen. Although it was revised before it was adopted on June 29, 1776, this new constitution is fundamentally Mason's work. Throughout the war, Martha Washington went to her husband's camp every winter. She was not only a comfort to him, but she also nursed his men and wrote letters for them. She was a selfless, courageous, and patriotic woman. Despite their differences, George Washington and Brian Fairfax remained friends. Because of his connections to the British nobility, Fairfax felt he was in an ideal position to be a peacemaker between the two sides. He was on his way to mediate the conflict when he was taken into custody by colonial troops. Halt. Cover. Arm. He refused to take a loyalty oath to the colonies and was jailed as a British spy. He immediately wrote his old friend for help. Washington promptly came to his rescue and sent a pass that would get Bryan safely through the American lines. The difference in our political sentiments has made no change in my friendship for you. I esteem and revere every man who acts from principle as I am persuaded you do, and shall ever contribute my aid to facilitate any inclination you may wish to indulge. Unsuccessful in his attempt to go to England, Brian Fairfax returned home to Fairfax County. He now seriously considered taking holy orders. In 1780, the Virginia legislature proposed confiscating the Fairfax estate at Belvoir. Washington intervened, and his influence stopped the legislature from proceeding further. Then, in April 1781, 
The British proceeded up the Potomac, destroying homes and property. Washington's own estate was threatened as the British sloop of war, Savage, anchored off Mount Vernon. The British came ashore and threatened to put the plantation to the torch. They took on board 17 of Mount Vernon's slaves, promising them their freedom. Lund Washington at first refused to cooperate, but then he went on board to negotiate. He did win the safety of Mount Vernon, but at a high price. He had to provide the enemy with hogs, sheep, and many other supplies. When George Washington heard this news from no less a person than the Marquis de Lafayette, he was furious with his cousin. I would have preferred that they had burnt my house. You ought to have considered yourself as my representative and reflected on the bad example of communicating with the enemy. In October of 1781, Washington, in a fast and daring move, trapped Lord Cornwallis and 7,000 British troops at Yorktown. With the assistance of his French allies, Washington forced Cornwallis to surrender. The revolution was won. Washington knew that there was no point winning the revolution if its ideals were sacrificed along the way. When some of his men proposed that Washington become king, he refused. When some of his officers formed a plan to march on Congress to demand back pay, Washington stopped them. When the peace treaty was finally concluded, Washington disbanded the army and resigned his commission as commander in chief. The world was astonished. Here was a man who could easily have made himself emperor or king. Washington taught the nation that serving the ideals of liberty and the civilian government was a source of honor and pride. After eight years of fighting, the soldiers of the revolution returned home to Fairfax. Although there had been no major battles fought here, their families and farms had suffered immensely from the neglect of their unselfish service. Even Mount Vernon had suffered. The house was run down and the fields were badly neglected. In 1783, Washington was greatly saddened when Belvoir, the site of so many fond memories of his youth, burned down. But alas, Belvoir is no more. I took a ride there the other day to visit the ruins, and ruins indeed they are, when I considered that the happiest moments of my life had been spent there. I was obliged to fly from them and came home with painful sensations and sorrowing for the contrast. As a private citizen after the war, Washington began a project to improve navigation of the Potomac River. Since the Potomac was technically part of the state of Maryland, there was much confusion over navigation rights. In an effort to clarify the issue, delegates from the two states met at Mount Vernon in March of 1785. George Mason and Alexander Henderson represented the interests of Virginia. The delegates worked out a compromise that provided for free trade on the river. The Mount Vernon Compact, as the agreement was known, was ratified by the two states, who then invited the other states to send delegates to another convention in Annapolis in 1786. The Annapolis Convention, in turn, led to a call for a general meeting in Philadelphia beginning in May of 1787 for the purpose of revising the Articles of Confederation. Washington and Mason were among the Virginians appointed to go to Philadelphia. The convention elected Washington as its president. When it was decided to draft an entirely new constitution, Mason contributed much to the debates and the formation of the new document of government. Eventually, Washington and Mason had a falling out over the constitution. Mason was one of only three men who refused to sign the document. He opposed the constitution because it did not include any protection of individual rights against the power of the new government. To make the Constitution the law of the land, conventions in nine of the 13 states had to vote to ratify it. In Fairfax, sentiment was strongly in favor of ratification, mostly because of Washington's support. George Mason was criticized and vilified in the local paper. George Mason was one of, if not the, most important opponent of ratification at the Virginia Ratification Convention. 
He opposed the Constitution primarily because it had no specific written protections for those liberties which he thought every citizen should enjoy. Where are they secured, he asked, by implication? In the end, even though the Convention ratified the Constitution, Mason forced a deal by which the Convention also instructed the delegates to the new Federal Congress to introduce and work for those amendments to the Constitution to protect those civil liberties based on Mason's 1776 Declaration of Rights. It was a very important role he played. In late June 1788, the Constitution became the law of the land. There were celebrations in Alexandria. Cannon roared and the town was illuminated. In April 1789, George Washington was elected the first president of the United States by the unanimous vote of the Electoral College. Washington was celebrated in every town along the route. On April 30th, 1789, he was inaugurated at Federal Hall on Wall Street. Mason played no part in the new federal government. He even refused an appointment to represent Virginia in the Senate. In December 1791, however, he had the satisfaction of seeing the Bill of Rights, based in part on his Virginia Declaration of Rights, added to the federal constitution. Less than a year later, Mason died at Gunston Hall. After serving two terms as the first president of the United States, Washington returned home to Martha and Mount Vernon. His friendship with George Mason was a thing of the past, but his friendship with Brian Fairfax endured. Brian had been ordained as a minister in the Episcopal Church of Virginia. He became eighth Lord Fairfax in 1793. To be near his old friend, George Washington, Brian had built a new house on the outskirts of Alexandria, not too far from Mount Vernon. He called it Mount Eagle, a name perhaps suggested by Washington. The final chapter in their long friendship occurred in December of 1799. After dining at Mount Eagle on the 7th, Washington returned the favor by entertaining Brian at Mount Vernon on the 11th. Three days later, on December 14th, George Washington was dead. In his last will and testament, Washington bequeathed to his old friend, Brian Fairfax, a ceremonial Bible. To his countrymen, George Washington left an enduring legacy of heroic leadership, unselfish patriotism, and far-reaching vision. He set a standard of honest and proper conduct that remain a model and an inspiration to the present day. Thomas Jefferson said it best. His integrity was most pure. His justice the most inflexible I have ever known. He was indeed in every sense of the words, a wise, a good, and a great man. On the whole, his character was in its mass perfect, in nothing bad in few points indifferent. And it may truly be said that never did nature and fortune combine more perfectly to make a man great and to place him in the same constellation with whatever worthies have merited from man an everlasting remembrance.